Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Dish. As I told you last night, I'm one of the self-appointed historians in in Alcoholics Anonymous. And what we're going to do this morning is a doctor's opinion, which is this man right here. In case you haven't seen pictures of him, he's uh, he really was a kind of called a medical saint by members of AA in New York. And uh, when the first group conscious of alcoholics was held, it was held in Akron, Ohio, in 1937 by about 22 or 23 people, and they finally realized they had something good going. But they also knew that if they held it to themselves and tried to pass it on verbally, it was going to lose a lot of its importance. So they had a vote, and they took a vote on whether they was going to have a book or not. And even among all the skeptics and everything else, they voted by by two votes to have a book. And that the book, uh, because uh, Bill Wilson... Was, had more knowledge than anybody else about this disease, they asked Bill to write the book. And so uh, Bill dictated this book to his first secretary, Ruth Hawk, who typed it up, double-spaced it on paper, with, you know, with the old paper in between, so she would have copies, you know, what that used to be like. Nobody knows that except Bob and I. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and they, uh, the first two chapters he wrote was Bill's story, and there is a solution. And so he wanted to find out whether the information in these two chapters had any importance to people uh, that suffer from this disease. So he sent it out to some doctors and psychologists and psychiatrists and, and let them review it to find out if he was really on the ball and was really doing what we needed to be done. And they all reviewed it favorably. In fact... He sent one to John Hopkins Hospital, and the doctor there in charge with Dr. Esther Richards. And Dr. Richards wrote him back and say, I give this these two chapters no higher compliment than to say that I read it through without stopping. Uh, Dr. Richards recommended a bill to get a number one physician who had wide knowledge of the alcoholic medical and social problems to write an introduction to the book. Uh, and Bill immediately went to Dr. Silkworth, who was at Towns Hospital for the history part of it, in charge of Towns Hospital, and asked him if he would write a forward to the chapter which was going to be called Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, Dr. Silkworth was not a writer, but what he said, Bill, he said, I've written three letters to the American Medical Association about the disease of alcoholism. And I'll give you these three letters, and if you can use them, then go ahead and do them. So Bill took them, and so Bill put together the doctor's opinion. And as we read the book, you can see where Bill's writing, and also where he inserts one of the letters. So that's what we're going to be looking at, those two different points. All right? He also wrote that, that the doctor's opinion would be a powerful endorsement from a medical person admitting that sometimes the medical community could not answer <clears throat> a disease such as alcoholism. And then he called this, and the new moral psychology, which was the beginning, beginning of the big book, moral psychology. You heard Mary talk about moral being... I, I call this truth about ourselves, moral psychology. That's all I say, truth about ourselves. And that's what the big book is going to try to uncover. Uh, this is a little bit of trivia. Uh, when we finally finished the big book and we sent it off to the, have it published, the publisher didn't know, so he titled the book from the doctor's opinion and put ch- page one. So the first edition of the big book had 179 pages. It wasn't until 1955 that Bill discovered his error and realized that his story, Bill's story, is supposed to be page one, 
And that he put the, well, he had an ego, right? You're already getting there. <laughs> Bill didn't want anything to kind of take anything away from himself. So he put the Roman numerals on the doctor's opinion. So, uh, and uh, the other thing about it, even though Dr. Silkworth gave these letters, you'll find in the book where there's a, where they got his signature there. He didn't sign the first edition book. He was still a little bit skeptical that maybe some of the other medical doctors would think he was a quack. And so it was just an opinion he had, you know. And that's the way everybody looks at it. Uh, but later on in 1955, the response was so good with what he had written in the doctor's opinion that he went in and he signed the second edition book. So he even started believing in some of the things that he had written. Joan down there shaking her head. She's one of those historians, too. Uh, and Dr. Silkworth was not an alcoholic, but by the, medic, by the AA community, he was kind of called a medical saint. Now, Dr. Bob and Bill weren't called saints, but they called this man a saint. He treated over... 5,000 alcoholics, I think, in his days at, uh, at Towns Hospital. That's, that's a lot of alcoholics. And he was a graduate of Princeton University and the New York University School of Medicine. He took his internship at Bellevue Hospital. Most of us know Bellevue Hospital really as being a kind of a psychiatric hospital. But Dr. Silkworth was assigned there, and he found out that a lot of those people in the hospital was really alcoholics. They weren't really crazy. But they, that, back in those days, that's where they put us, either in an asylum or some kind of hospital and tried to get rid of us. Well, he started working with alcoholics in Bellevue Hospital. The other thing he had done is his family left him a lot of money. And so he invested with these people in New York City about a new hospital that was going to be put in and, in and around New York City in which he was going to be one of the the doctors at this hospital. Well, as we know, in the 1929 and 30 and 31, the Great Depression hit, and he lost all his money. You know, after his internship, he was working at Bellevue Hospital, and things got so bad there, they laid him off. He didn't have a job. So Sam Lambert, Dr. Sam Lambert at Bellevue Hospital, who was his boss over there, knew this horse trader, this guy named Charlie Towns that was from Georgia, who was a railroad man, who came up with this medicine man tonic that was laced with opium that he was selling, and he made tons of money, you know? And then he sold the product to somebody else and made more money, and then he went to New York City and bought this old building and he put in a hospital for alcoholic and, and other addictions. God, this guy had to be a genius, isn't it? He sold something to get you addicted, then turn around and say, go over here and you get help. I mean, really, he had it going on both sides of the fence. Uh, so Charlie Towns and Sam Lambert opened up Towns Hospital. And most of the people they attracted were the people on Broadway, Hollywood stars, uh, people that in the wealthy community because they were the only one that had money. And in order to get into town's hospital, you had to pay your way in. There was no billing at all during those days. So Bill went in there four times. Our, our co-founder was in town's hospital four times. His entrance into the hospital was paid for by his brother-in-law, you know, Dr. Leonard Strong, and his mother, Emily, who was a doctor. So Bill comes from, you know, pretty wide stock. Uh, so now we're going to read the doctor's opinion. If you turn it and open it up and follow me there, <clears throat> you'll see where Bill starts writing the introduction. And he says, uh, we. Now, when I see the word we in the big book, I think that's the strongest word we have. In AA. It represents today nearly three million people. We. Look here at all of us here. We. It said, of Alcoholics Anonymous believe that the reader 
will be interested in a medical estimate of the plan of recovery described in this book. And I'm, you know, I'm, let me explain this to you. You know, AA is divided into three sections, really. Uh, the first section is the program, and the program can be found in the first 164 pages of the big book. And the second section is experiences, and those are the stories in the big book and the 12 and 12, pass it on, Dr. Bob and the good old timers, any other book that has to do with AA. And the third portion is opinions. And I've got opinions. So when I express something, you may disagree with it, but please don't argue. It's just my opinion. Okay? My first opinion is that the medical estimate of this book, the information in this book can help an alcoholic to a better life when practice as a way of life. The doctor, I mean, Bill Wright's convincing testimony must, must surely come from medical men who have experience from the suffering of our members and have witnessed a return to health. A well-known doctor, chief physician of a nationally prominent hospital. Now, Bill Wilson really gave that a piece of some writing, didn't he? That was Dr. Silkworth working at Towns Hospital, which is at 293 Central Park West, or 89th Street in Brooklyn, New York. Specializing in alcoholic and drug addiction gave Alcoholics Anonymous this letter. To whom it may concern. Now, this is Dr. Silkworth. <clears throat> I have specialized in the treatment of alcoholism for many years. At that time, he had been working with alcoholics for nine years. All right, most of them were at Bellevue Hospital. The rest of town. In late 1934, I attended a patient who, though he had been a competent businessman of good earning capacity, was an alcoholic of the type I had to come to regard as hopeless. This was Bill Wilson, our co-founder. He was in town, as I said earlier, four times. The other thing I want you to note here that the doctor did not say he earned good money. You notice he said he had good earning capacity. Bill never had a, a, a reliable job after, you know, the Depression hit. He lived off, he lived off his wife until the, the royalties from the big book came in, and that way he, he, he had a form of living. So Dr. Silkworth was speaking the truth at the time. He had good earning capacity. In the course of his third treatment, <clears throat> he acquired certain ideas. At this time is when he was visited by a man named Ebby Thacker, who, if you remember, uh, in the big book, he's pointed out <clears throat> as being rescued by uh, two guys, Sieber Graves, Shep Cornell, three guys, and Roland Hazard. They was going to put Ebby in the insane asylum, and uh, they rescued him out of the courtroom. He had been arrested four times for public intoxication, and they took him to the Oxford Group which was a Christian organization of first century Christianity, which was the teachings of Jesus Christ. Ebby got sober. And he got sober by the Oxford, Oxford Group principles. And what he did, he turned around to his good friend and he was bringing those principles to him. So these are the certain ideas that Bill Wilson got, was the Oxford Group principles. All right? And the, uh, all right. And the ideas that he got was surrender and the steps, helping others and using a higher power or your conception of God, which was something that really makes an alcoholic comfortable. You know, a lot of people come in here, we start talking about God, and they run out that room. You know, but when they hear, well, you can choose your own conception of God, or you can have a higher power, or whatever it is, it kind of softens it up, and then we can come into this fellowship, and we get the opportunity to have our own choice of God. Big deal for me. All right. Concerning a possible means of recovery, it says, as part of his rehabilitation, he commenced to present his conception to other alcoholics. See that? That's the secret of our fellowship. One alcoholic talking to another. Impressing upon them that they must do likewise with still others. This is our famous AA, one AA talking to another one. And you know that always works. It may not get the, the other person into recovery, but they listen to us. And so we planted the seed. And hopefully they'll come back someday. 
Now, this has become the basis. So the, even the doctor is saying this has become the basis of a rapidly growing fellowship of these men and their families. This man and over 100 other appear to have recovered. I know, I personally know scores of cases who were of the type with whom other methods had failed completely. Dr. Silkworth's success rate wasn't very good at Towns Hospital. And if you, if you take in consideration that some of the best ministers in the whole world, some of the best psychiatrists in the whole world, and some of the best medical doctors, when they work with alcoholics, their recovery rate is less than 3%. So consequently, Bill Wilson's ideas came foremost in Dr. Silkworth's eyes at helping him in recovery at Towns Hospital. These facts appear to be of extreme medical importance because of the extraordinary possibility the rapid growth inherited in this group. They may mark a new epoch in the annuals of alcoholism. These men may well have a remedy for thousands of such situations. You may rely absolutely on anything they say about themselves, very truly yours. Dr. Shelford. He believed in everything that Bill Wilson had learned and was trying to pass on to the other alcoholics. Bill Wilson was a, was a visionary. He had vision far down the road more than any other individual. Uh, a couple of things that he had vision about, he wanted to put in a big hospital, you know, where Dr. Bob could go and be a medical doctor and can help people. He also wanted to put in a second floor of teaching missionaries to go out and to help other alcoholics. Well, when you really think about it, those visions came true because the hospitals we have today are treatment centers. Now, not all of them go by AA principles, but nevertheless, there are some treatment centers that help alcoholics. The other visionary of missionaries are people like Mary, George, and Shay, and them who come to places like this to share their message with us. So Bill's vision was really on the ball in 1937. And here it is, 2007. The physician. Bill refers to him as a physician here. He called him a medical director earlier. Who at all requests gave us this letter had been kind enough to enlarge upon his views in another statement which follows. In this statement he confirms what we have suffered, what we who have suffered alcoholic torture must believe that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind. <clears throat> this must that's in this statement right here can be taken two ways. The first way it is, this is an inescapable conclusion of anyone who has experienced alcoholic addiction and the phenomenon of craving. Not true with the people who don't have, suffer from the disease. The second thing it tells you is the doctor must also be expressing to us that the conviction is a necessary component of our recovery. So that must that we read before that is, that's the way I look at it. It did not satisfy us to be told that we could not control our drinking because we were, here comes three things that the doctor sees in alcoholics. One, <clears throat> that we were maladjusted to life. Two, that we were in full flight from reality. Oh, boy. <laughs> and get this one. Or were outright mental defectives. <laughs> I take it from that response that you fit all three categories. <laughs> These things were true to some extent. In fact, to a considerable extent with some of us. These are defects up here in our mind. Okay? That's where they are, up here. And that's what I think that refers to. We are sure that our bodies are sick and as well. In our belief, any picture of the alcoholic which leaves out the physical factor is incomplete. Well, the doctor's theory explained why we are unable to stop drinking once we begin. You know, we stop off after work to have one drink. We wind up staying until closing. You know, we just have one drink to relax. And we end up drunk. Understanding the physical reason for this is as important as the medical causes. When an alcoholic drinks, we develop a physical craving 
for alcohol, compelling us to continue drinking. The doctor is going to explain that we suffer from a twofold disease. The first of it is an allergy, I mean an obsession of the mind, which is going to always tell us it's okay to have one drink. And for if we suffer from the disease, once we take that drink, our body's going to say, God, I'd like to have another one. It doesn't come from here to the second drink. It comes from here. And then it keeps coming, and keeps coming, and it keeps coming. And that's why we stay till closing time. Now, the doctor's theory that we have an allergy to alcohol interests us. And allergy is nothing but an abnormal reaction. As layman, our opinion as to its soundness may, of course, mean little. But as ex-problem drinkers, we can say that his explanation makes good sense. It explains many things for which we cannot otherwise account. Now, reading this chapter helps us take the first step in recovering. Admitting we have a problem with alcohol is not so difficult when the physical aspect of the illness is so clearly illustrated. And it says, though we work out our solution on the spiritual as well as the altruistic plane, that's belief in a higher power as well as helping others. We favor hospitalization for the alcoholic who is very jittery or befogged. More often than not, it is imperative that a man's brain be cleared before he is approached, and he has a better chance of understanding and accepting what we have to offer. The doctor saw the value of medical care during withdrawals from alcohol. Applications of the theory and techniques presented in this book can best begin after we emerge from the fog of our last drink. What this book has to offer is a simple kit of spiritual tools, the 12 steps. The tools are offered to us rather than forced upon us. The doctor writes, the subject presented in this book seems to be, seems to me to be of paramount importance to those afflicted with alcoholic addiction. Now what could be more important to a practicing alcoholic than the hope of a solution? We deceive ourselves about what the problem with our lives really is. Uh, we think the problem is our spouses or our children or our bosses or whoever. Then we, though we may have many problems, the one we must address is our alcoholism. I say this after many years' experience as medical director of one of the oldest hospitals in the country treating alcoholic and drug addiction. I don't know where's the first uh, hospital at all for that. I don't. I don't really know. I've, we tried to check on it, and there was some other places were doing some of this, but. Uh, they weren't around very long. So uh, probably when the doctor writes this, it's probably a very true statement. The doctor's many years of experience lends weight to the endorsement of the program of recovery that Bill's going to be writing in there. This was, therefore, a sense of real satisfaction when I was asked to contribute a few words on the subject was recovered in masterly detail in these pages. Well, that's a big statement, isn't it? Masterly detail. We doctors have realized for a long time that some form of moral psychology, truth about ourselves, was of urgent importance to alcoholics, but its application presented difficulties beyond our conception. He admits that our doctor, that the medical profession cannot do anything for us, very little for us. And besides that, if doctors were able to relive us of alcoholism, they would. You know, they'd give us some kind of pill and we'd be all right. If we don't respond to their medical care, then we must be beyond human help. We must be. Dr. Silkworth perceived that a complete change in an alcoholic's ideas and attitudes about life is what needed in recovery. He concedes that medical science is not effective as bringing forth this change as well as beyond the realm of human ability. What with our ultra-modern standards, our scientific approach to everything, we are perhaps not well equipped to apply the powers of good that lie outside our synthetic knowledge. Again, a reference to the alcoholic, the abnormal reaction to alcohol. Many years ago, one of our leading contributors, now he's going to talk about Bill Wilson. Bill Wilson was under Dr. Silkworth's care of Towns Hospital when Abby showed him the simple program of action. This, along with his knowledge of the physical aspect of alcoholism, which he learned from Dr. Silkworth, and the practice of carrying the solution to others by the Oxford group, 
Now we are being presented with the solution. Are we willing to put the program into practical application at once? Are we able to do that? So this book came under our care in the hospital while here he acquired certain ideas which, there again, one alcoholic talking with another alcoholic, belief in a power greater than herself, restitution, confession, those absolutes from the Oxford group. He put into practical application at once. Bill Wilson believed in those things. Not to the extent of the absolutes. He took them and he changed them around a little bit because he knew the alcoholic could not accept anything absolutely. So he toned them down a little bit and, and reworked them into something that we could understand. Later, he presented the privilege of being allowed to tell his story to other patients here and with some misgivings. The doctor did not know for sure this would work. You know, the doctor talked with these alcoholics all the time. Now an alcoholic was talking to them. And you know what? They were able to identify. And he said, we consented. The cases we have followed through with are most interesting. In fact, many of them are amazing. The unselfishness of these men as we have come to know them, the entire absence of profit motives, and their community spirit is indeed inspiring to one who has labored long and wearily in the alcoholic field. For those reasons right there he just wrote about, Alcoholics Anonymous is, is very successful at carrying the solution to millions of alcoholics. At Akron City Hospital, after the men were dried out in five days, and every day they was given a certain step to work, once they released after detox, guess what they had to do? They had to come back to the hospital and help those that were still in there. They believed in themselves, and still more in the power which pulls chronic alcoholics back from the gates of death. Now, medical science is skilled at drying drunks out. Keeping them dry is the difficulty. There is only one power that can do that, and it had to be a power greater than ourselves. Of course, an alcoholic ought to be freed from his physical craving for liquor. The obsession that tells us it's okay to have one drink again. Our minds will always lie to us and tell us it's okay to take that drink. Always going to tell me it's okay to have one drink. And, after, and this often requires a definite hospital procedure. Today, hospitals are almost out of date as handling it. They don't handle as many alcoholics as they used to. Uh, maybe we have detox centers all around that probably take you in for five days, maybe 14 days, or whatever they do to get you off that particular addiction. Before And says that you've got to be dried out before psychological measures can be a maximum benefit. You know, it doesn't really matter how you get here. If you're an alcoholic like me, it does matter how we present these people with the program of AA. That's what's important. We believe, and so suggested a few years ago, Dr. Silkworth wrote an article for a magazine called The Lancet in 1937. And that's what he's making, uh, pulling your attention to. And he says that the action of alcohol on these chronic, chronic means daily users, Alcoholics is the manifestation of an allergy. And that is twofold again. That the phenomenal craving is limited to this class and never occurs in an average temperate drinker. My wife is an average temp temperate drinker. She can take one glass of wine at dinner time and she'll say, Ooh, I'm getting... I'm starting to feel that. I better have a cup of coffee. Not so with us. <laughs> it says, Pow! i got to have another. These allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. And once having formed the habit and found they cannot break it, once having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon th things human, their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to, to solve. Uh, Mary touched about some of the problems last night. She referred to them as the bedevilments. It also calls them, age, they calls them human problems. They're on page 52 in the big book. Uh, and uh, I, she didn't do it, but I often ask people to raise their hands if, if, they, if they suffer from the problem at all that is listed in here. 
And, of course, the first thing it asks is, it says to us that we're having trouble with personal relationships. Now, when you answer this before you came in here, is this true? Huh? Oh, boy, good. <laughs> How about the second one? Uh, we were having uh, emotional nature. Very much so. How about the third one? You know, we were a prey to misery and depression. You too, Richard? How about we couldn't make a living? That don't mean hold down a job. Living encompasses everything involved in living. Holding down a job, going to the grocery store, paying your bills, things like that. How about the next one? We had a feeling of uselessness. Oh, I seen some hands in the back go up real quick on that. How about that? We were full of fear. You talked about that last night, and George McShane duplicated it. How about we were unhappy? This is the one that really gets me, though. We couldn't seem to be a real help to other people. Who in the hell wanted to be? <laughs> I mean, really, I don't understand that one. That's the only one I disagree with. I never gave that one thought when I was drinking. Hell with you. More for me. Correct? Okay. So Mary covered those pretty good, and, and I think a lot of you raised your hands. Just for the heck of it, did how many raised your hands on all of them? Oh, welcome to AA. <laughs> it says in here, and I love this, uh, uh, frothy emotional appeals seldom suffices. You know, everyone who loves or cares about us begins to plead with us to quit drinking. We may be angered with their meddling or, and ignore their pleas. We may sincerely want to quit and swear off for a time, or two, or three, or four. But we always return to drinking. Uh, the people in the big book have been where we were and offered to show us what they have done to recover. Perhaps we could listen. They propose to show us how to access the power which will recreate our lives. And then it goes on to say, the message which can interest and hold these alcoholic people must have depth and weight. The solution, you know, for, for the message is the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, in nearly all cases, their ideals must, there's another must, be grounded in a power greater than ourselves. If they are to recreate their lives. I don't know. I think I counted one time the must in the big book, and I got up to 119. And uh, so when I think of must, that means something I must do, right? So 119 times in the first 164 pages, it tells us that. Uh, we would not need to cre recreate our lives if we could modify our behavior, though. You know that? And we're able to manage our lives successful. That's why the first step is so important. You know? We get a chance to do over. That's not my saying I stole that from somebody. But we do get a chance to do over. Goes on to say, if any feel that a psychiatrist, Dr. Silkworth's degree was really in neuropsychiatry. So he wasn't really a medical doctor, he's kind of a head doctor. Uh, he directed a hospital for alcoholics. There again, Towns Hospital. We appear somewhat sentimental. Let them stand with us for a while on the firing line. Doctors have a hard time when they treat alcoholics. They see the tragedies. And let me tell you, a good many of us die drunk. Good many of us. I don't know what the percentage is, but it's very, very high. Or by suicide. Last year, I know in Tallahassee alone, we had nine suicides that I know of. How about their despairing wives? Some of them just don't know what to do or what to say or anything else. They have no experience. How about the little kids? You know, they don't understand us at all. They only want their parent back. I always ask, a lot of the, the places where I do some uh, workshops is uh, the, the people who have kids is look at yourself through their eyes. Unconditional love. 
And that's all they want. They want their parents back. <clears throat> Let the solving of these problems become a part of their daily work. And even of their sleeping moments. So you have to work when you're sleeping. And the most cynical will not wonder why we have accepted and encouraged this movement. We feel, after many years of experience, that we have found nothing which has contributed more to the rehabilitation of these men than the altruistic movement now growing up a mountain. Men and women drink excessively because they like the effect produced by alcohol. Did anybody ever believe in that commercial by Miller Beer Company that it tastes good? Nah. May good. My wife may think it tastes good, but you know, I love the effect. And most of us do. And this description right here helps us take the first step. It describes our behavior clearly so we can see from our own experience how that parallels to an alcoholic. The description ends with an illustration of the baffling nature of the disease that we continue to drink even when we truly desire to stop. The sensation, the effect, is so elusive that while they admit it's injurious, they cannot after a time differentiate the truth from the false. To them, their alcoholic life seems only the normal one. Get this biggie. They are restless, irritable, and discontented unless they can again experience a sense and ease and comfort which comes at once by taking a few drinks, which they see others taking with impunity. I, that's so true in my life today because I wanted to drink like a lot of my buddies. A lot of my buddies could have four or five drinks, quit, and go home. I could never do that. A lot of them had good marriages. I couldn't do that. A lot of them are good fathers. I couldn't do that. After they had succumbed to the desire again, this time it will be different. You know, this time it's going to be different, right? As so many people do, and the phenomenal craving develops. They pass through the well-known stages of a spree. Maybe for a day, maybe for two, maybe for a week, maybe for two weeks. They often emerge remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over unless this person can experience an entire psychic change. See, the doctor says we need a psychic change. We read on and Dr. Young tells us we need a vital spiritual experience. We read on and William James tells us we need a spiritual awakening. In the appendix to the big book, Bill Wilson writes, we need a personality change. So it's the same thing they're talking about. There is very little hope for our recovery. This, this, this cycle must be broken or we're going to die. You know, George talked about it last night. That's what's going to happen to us. We're going to die. Uh, much more is needed, uh, better than intentions or vows to quit drinking. You know, we must experience an entire psychic change, complete change. Uh, I asked my sponsor one time, uh, how many things in my life do I need to change? You know, it's, I know you're laughing already because that's a stupid question. You don't ask your sponsor something like that. <laughs> but you've got to remember, I was new. And he just looked at me and he said, just about everything you do. That's true. I had to change just about everything I did. Uh, and one of the biggest things I hated to do was uh, these drinking buddies I told you to run around with. I had to break away from them. We used to go to all kinds of excursions, a lot of football games. Uh, you know, when you used to go to football games, the state troopers were there and they'd check you for brown bags or, or anything like that. Let me tell you what I did. I went to a sporting goods store and I bought me the largest pair of binoculars that they had. I hollowed them out. I lined them. And I could put seven ounces of booze in this side and seven ounces in this side. I put it around my neck and Waved at the state troopers, so I went and bought them. <laughs> Normal people don't do things like that. <laughs> uh, 
The very same person who seemed doomed, who had so many problems he despaired of ever solving them, suddenly finds himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol. Isn't that amazing? The only effort necessary being that he required to follow a few simple rules. Work the 12 steps until you start living the 12 steps. We'll eventually get the, the discipline necessary to, to live the life that we've always supposed to have lived. Now, men have cried out to me in sincere and despairing appeal. Doctor, I cannot go on like this. I have everything to live for. I must stop. I cannot. You must help me. The doctor cannot help him. Faced with this problem, as the doctor is honest with himself, he must sometimes feel his own inadequacy. Although he gives all that is in him, it is often not enough. Though the aggregate of recoveries resulted from psychiatric effort is considerable, we physicians must admit we have made very little impression upon the problem as a whole. I told you that's 3%, but at that time that was pretty good because most of them weren't, weren't having any success with alcoholics. Many types do not respond to the ordinary psychological approach. That's basically a lack of discipline. You know, we're going to lie to psychiatrists. We're not going to tell them the truth. Who's ever going to admit they drink too much? How many, how many drinks you had today? Ah, uh, probably one or two. <laughs> you know, we're going to lie. I do not hold with those who believe that alcoholism is entirely a problem of mental control. Now, I, I put, how well has mental control worked in keeping us from that first drink? How well does it work to control our drinking once we start? It answers that in the big book and those two questions it asks us on page 44. I have had many men who had, for example, worked a period of months for, on some problem or business deal which was to be settled at a certain date favorably to them. They took a drink or so prior to that date. The obsession starts hitting them. Then the phenomenal craving. The body says, I need another. At once becomes paramount in all interest so that important appointments was not met. I was a traveling salesman for many years. And I had a good rapport with my customers. Alcoholic can manipulate anybody. And a lot of these guys really liked me. And uh, one time one of them said, hey, did you know there's a, a good job that's becoming available? And I told this uh, company about you. Uh, here's their address. I said, well, thank you. So I looked at that boy. It's a big company. And I said, okay. So I sent a resume into him. And I got a call from the, to, from the sales manager saying that he was going to come down and, and interview me along with about 24 or 25 other candidates. And so I went through the interview process and, and, uh, and after it was over, I got a call from the sales manager and said, well, we selected three people to be interviewed and the vice president's going to come down to interview you, three of you, and select one of you for this job. And you're one of them. And I said, somebody will be calling you. I said, wow. Uh, so I got a phone call from the secretary to the vice president saying that he was going to come in town. He was going to fly in town. And would I pick him up at the airport? You don't do that to an alcoholic. <laughs> My mind went nuts. Well, hell, I got this job already. Why, they, why did they call me to pick him up? Wow, my, it started going nuts. Well, I got all dressed up, and of course, I was at the airport at the point of ta- airport at the point of town, and guess what? It was delayed in Pittsburgh. It would be in at 6.30. Damn, that's five hours. What am I going to do? Well, I think I'll go down to my favorite hangout, you know, where Gary the bartender is. And maybe I can just talk to him. Well, let me tell you, if you've got a favorite bar, and when you walk in that door, boom, it's up there, right? Now what happens? The obsession kicks in. What? Well, it's okay to have one. You have one, then what happens? Craving stops, and you have that second one. I showed up to the airport. I met this vice president. I got his suitcases, put them in my car. I drove down off the airport. I pulled into the motel where he was staying. I got his suitcases out. 
and was going to carry him in. And he said, no, you can put him down there, Mr. Titcher. He said, matter of fact, you don't have to come back at all. I've seen about as enough as you as I need to see. A friend of mine got that job and worked it for 26 years. But that's that's the alcoholic life. And it also tells me it tells about myself. These men were not escape, drinking to escape. They were drinking to overcome a craving beyond their mental control. Uh, there are many situations which arise out of the phenomenal craving which cause men to take to make the supreme sacrifice rather than continue the fight. And what that means is a hopeless and self-loathing we feel when we find we cannot use self-will to overcome our drinking problem leads many alcoholics to commit suicide. The doctor goes on to write that the classification, Dr. Silkworth's going to write about five alcoholics. Bill later says in the, in the more, uh, more on alcoholics, there's, there's three different type of hard drinkers, he says. All right. Out's going to scope of this book. They are, of course. Here we go. Now, if you any you fit any of these descriptions, just raise your hands. There are, of course, the psychopaths. <laughs> Hell, you put your hand up for ever read. <laughs> these are emotionally unstable. We're familiar with this type. They're always going on the wagon for keeps. They are over remorseful and make many resolutions, but never a decision. There is a type of man who is unwilling to admit that he cannot take a drink. Good. He plans various ways of drinking. He changes his brand or his environment. Do you ever do that? I went from bourbon to scotch, from scotch to rye, to rye. I just wondered, anybody, the hard drinkers, uh, that means uh, whiskey, did you end up on vodka? <laughs> Welcome to AA. The third type, there is a type who also believes that after being entirely free from alcohol for a period of time, he can take a drink without danger. Here comes number four. There is a manic depressant type. Today I think the medical profession calls him bipolar. <laughs> who, now listen to this. Who is perhaps the least understood by his friends and about whom a whole chapter could be written? Let me see those hands again. <laughs> okay. Then here comes uh, my type. This is me. Then there are types entirely normal in every respect except in the effect alcohol has upon them. They are often able, intelligent, friendly people. <laughs> all these and many other have one symptom in common. All these, all these now, all five of these have one symptom in common. They cannot stop, start drinking without developing the phenomenon of craving. How and what we drink is not important. You know, uh, one of the most positive ways of determining if we are alcoholics, if we ever experience a phenomenal craving after we start to drink. If we take one drink, we act different. We react differently. If we all took one drink, and Lord, I hope that never happens, some of us will be dancing the jig, others over here will be crying, some will be over here fighting, others will be trying to put the make on somebody. <laughs> but the one thing we have in common is that we all look for another drink. Now, this phenomenon, we have suggested, may be the manifestation of an allergy. A lot of people suffer from ragweed. You know, they sneeze a lot. Their eyes get watery, you know. Uh, other has dysentery, allergic to milk sometimes. They, uh, things like that happen, and, you know. Uh, some have reactions to strawberries. I'm originally from West Virginia, and where I lived in West Virginia, we had real fertile soil. And my dad in the backyard would go out and till up about a 5 by 60 section, and he planted strawberries, about five rows of strawberries. After he got off work at night, he'd take a bucket and go out there, and he'd get those strawberries, and he'd fill it up, and he'd bring it in the house, and mom would wash it and cut off the green leaf, and then slice them up and put them in, put some sugar on them, you know, and 
nice him up a little bit, and then she'd make some kind of a pound cake or something. And then uh, I always grew up, you put milk over them. A lot of people put whipped cream on them today, but I grew up putting milk. Well, I had a brother and sister, too, and we loved to sit down and eat Dad's strawberries. A half an hour after we ate strawberries, my sister would break out in a, a rash. Her face would get flushed, and she'd run to the bathroom. And she would get rid of everything that she ate. You know, my sister ate strawberries for 19 more years before she found out she was allergic to them. <laughs> okay, you got the picture, didn't you? All right. This differentiates these people and sets them apart as a distinct entity. If, they, if it has never been by any treatment for which we are familiar permanently eradicated, the only relief that we have to suggest is entire abstinence. That's the doctor's opinion, entire abstinence. Uh, this immediately precipitates into a seething cauldron of debate. Many have been written, many have written pro and calm, but among physicians, the general opinion seen that most chronic alcoholics are doomed. What is the solution? Perhaps I can best answer this by relating experiences. The good news here is that there is a solution. You know, we are only seemingly hopeless, it says in the first forward. Uh, where are we to place our hope if our past experiences prove that us we're beyond human aid? Uh, we can gain hope from those who have gone on before us. The old timer. Listen to the old timers. That's the only way you're ever going to become one. About one year prior to this experience, a man was brought into, treated for chronic alcoholism. This is A.E. number two in New York. His name was Hank Parkhurst. His story was in the first edition called The Unbeliever. He was a high-priced salesman for Standard Oil of New Jersey. He was the guy that, that was a big promoter that had all the big ideas. He was a guy that wanted to, the, the, for AA to own their own big book. He went out and he got uh, uh, stock that he was going to sell for $25 a share and signed his name as president. He also had a big ego. Uh, Hank had been partially recovered from gastric hemorrhage, bleeding, and seemed to be a case of pathological mental deterioration. He had lost everything. They fired him as the executive sales manager for Standard Oil in New Jersey. They fired him. He had lost everything in life, worthwhile in life, and was living on, one might say, to drink. He frankly admitted and believed that for him there was no hope. He was in town's hospital, and Bill talked to him. And guess what? He took the first step. And following the elimination of alcohol, there was found to be no permanent brain injury. He accepted the plan outlined in this book. Follow the program of action, steps 3 through 12. One year later, he called to see me, and I experienced a very strange sensation. I know the man by name and partly recognize his features, but they're always in what's ended. From a trembling, despairing, nervous wreck had emerged a man brimming over with self-reliance and contentment. I talked with him for some time, but was not able to bring myself to feel that I had known him before. To me, he was a stranger, and so he left me. A long time has passed with no return to alcohol. Now, when I need a mental uplift, I often think of another case brought in by a physician prominent in New York. This is Fitz Mayo. He's our southern friend in the big book. Uh, he was a guy that uh, helped Bill Wilson find the name for the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. The, the, we wanted to be called the book The Way Out. So Bill Wilson asked Fitz, who lived in, uh, in between Baltimore and Washington, if he'd go to the Library of Congress and look up and see how many books were called The Way Out. Fitz did this and called Bill back and said, there's 12 books called The Way Out. Well, that killed that name because we're not going to be the 13th book. <laughs> so that's the way we eventually ended up getting the name of the Alcoholics Anonymous. 
Bill uh, Phil um, Fitz also came out of Towns Hospital. He was those guys that sat in there about believing in God, and then all of a sudden that light came and the winds and everything. And he fell out of his bed and got down to his knees. The story's in the big book. Uh, the patient had made his own diagnosis. <laughs> Does that sound like somebody in here? <laughs> the sign that his situation hopeless had hidden in a deserted barn determined to die. He was rescued by a searching party in a desperate condition brought to me. Following his physical rehabilitation, I don't know why we continue to believe that willpower was the answer to our problems. If willpower effective against physical ailments, is it? I don't think so. Dr. Silkworth thought that our inability to control our drinking was the result of an allergy, an increasing susceptibility to alcohol. He had talked with me, which he frankly stated he thought that treatment a waste of effort, unless I could assure him, which no one ever had, that in the future he would have the willpower to resist the impulse to drink. We can't promise anybody anything like that. His alcoholic, talking about Fitz Mayo here again, his alcoholic problem was so complex and his depression so great. That's another thing. You know that all alcoholics suffer from depression. Yeah, I think most of you answered that in the human problems and the bedevilments. We all suffer from that. We just can't get out of it with the 12 steps. You know, we got to be treated separately. We can't include it in our program and don't fly that way at all. That we felt his only hope would be through what was in, called moral psychology. And we doubted if even that would have any effect. However, he did become sold on the ideas contained in this book. Well, if, if we can't cure ourselves, are we willing to examine the solution presented in these pages? Are we willing to do that? Are we looking for, are we willing to look for a solution? Where else do we have to turn? I think being sold is one way of expressing that the man made a decision to put the program of action to work in his life. He started to listen to Bill Wilson and others. It says he has not had a drink for a great many years. I see him now and then, and he is the finest specimen of manhood as one could wish to make. Fitzmaio's sister was so thrilled that he got sober and went back to being a gentleman farmer, that she had some money, and she gave a, a $2,000 for the printing of the big book. That's one of those little known things we never hear about. It says, I earnestly advise every alcoholic to read this book through. And though he per perhaps he came to scoff, he may remain to pray. Now, I ask you this question. Are we willing to follow the doctor's advice? Are we finished with our attempts to control our drinking ourselves? Are we here to criticize and find the dissimilarities, or are we ready to accept the program of recovery but its proven record of success? Today, I, I hear different rates of success in Alcoholics Anonymous. I tried to take a little survey myself in, in around Tallahassee. I think we're holding our own. I think our success rate today is better than 50%. Some people say it's around 20 to 25%. I told you I was going to tell you something that nobody... Uh, in this room knows, and probably nobody in the state of Georgia or Florida knows, because I just found this out myself six months ago. That last statement where he says, perhaps he has, he came to scoff, he may remain to pray. Well, I was reading the story of Tom Sawyer, written by uh, Mark Twain or Samuel Clements. And in the second chapter, Tom tricks the boys in the neighborhood to pay him for the privilege of whitewashing the fence. And it says, they came to jeer but remained to whitewash. There was a footnote underneath there. 
And it says, the footnote said, the deserted village. Well, thanks to the Internet, because I didn't know what the desert village was. But it was a, it was a poem that was written by Oliver Goldsmith. And as I found this poem on the Internet, I went down to the 180th line. And uh, this is what it says. At church with meek and unaffected grace, his looks adorned a vernable place. Truth from his lips prevailed the double sway, and fools who came to scoff remain to pray. Dr. Selfworth must have read that book. And so that's where he got the original quote. Now, Selfworth told Bill Wilson to quit preaching to the drunks, you know, and to start telling them they were hopeless and it was a matter of life and death. That turned AA all around. Bill started changing the way that he was writing, changing the way he was talking, etc. That's the only way a drunk's going to listen to the spiritual remedy, which is really step two. Uh, this is a little bit of trivia. that Dr. Silkworth, like Dr. Bob, had a nurse that really took care of the alcoholic ward. Her name was Teddy, and she was a member of AA. Uh, Dr. Silkworth was respected by AA community so much that later in his years, the AA people around New York City gave him a testimonial dinner and presented him with a check of $25,000. He was elected as a non-member of the Board of AA in 1945, and he died in 1961 of a heart attack at his home in New York City. They say he treated nearly 40,000 alcoholics during his career. He never tried, he never tired of drunks. I think the information in this chapter of Doctor's Opinion that was accepted by the American Medical Association in 1955 as facts on alcoholism. Today, the doctor's opinion is not an opinion. If the alcoholic membership like to change the name of that maybe to facts on alcohol, but we we can have a hard time doing that. Because our forefathers said, yeah, you all can change anything you want to in the big book. Just get three quarters of the membership to agree. <laughs> That'll never going to happen. But anyway, I think uh, today if we have an addiction with anything, we know how to find a solution for it. You know, many of us have other addictions that we have, and we can we can find a solution for that. And I think the information in the doctor's opinion is one of those things that we can forever carry with us. We can tell it to another alcoholic and immediately they understand. Thank you. Had a good time. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.